This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Good evening and welcome back to Byline. It's been quite a while since we've uh, been together on Amherst Media with the help of the Amherst League of Women Voters, but here we are with a special edition of Byline. Um, we're all struggling with uh, social distancing and a lot of isolation and working from home. I hope uh, all of you are well, feeling safe, and having the support from friends and family and neighbors as we share this really remarkable experience together. And when I say remarkable, I don't say that in the best sense of the word. It is a really challenging time for us all. And so I'm glad we get to spend a little bit of time with you this evening. And we're going to do a special show uh, this evening. And the reason we decided to, to come back into your homes tonight is because our business community is suffering uh, significantly and the economic development in this community, which was kind of on a roll for a while there, has really been slowed down and, and people are really worried about the future, not only of our health and, and our community, but also about the e economics of our community. And so we have two guests with us this evening, back by popular demand, Gabrielle Gould, who is the executive director of our local business improvement district, and she's going to remind us in a minute what the Business Improvement District does in, in just a quick snapshot. And joining us for the first time is the Executive Director of the Amherst Chamber of Commerce, um, Claudia uh, Pasmani. And we're welcoming both of you this evening and glad you're here. We're going to talk a little bit about what the business uh, organizations here in town are doing to try to support our local uh, retail businesses. Uh, both what's happening right now and what will be happening in the coming months. So let's uh, start with you, Gabrielle. Could you just remind people what the Business Improvement District is? Absolutely. So uh, we have a district that is sort of mapped out as the Business Improvement District, and it is the downtown area of Amherst. And I uh, jokingly say that my bosses are the landlords, but I work for the businesses. Um, our goal when I took over this position was to continue to create a vibrant downtown and to work on Amherst being a destination for um, both our year-round residents and tourists alike. And COVID-19 has definitely shifted our um, sort of, you know, direction. We are now working hand in hand on a daily basis with the Chamber of Commerce, and we have blown down our boundaries and are working um, together to look at Amherst businesses as a whole and how we can find relief and resiliency and return to whatever our new normal is going to be. Great. And also, uh, let's just have a quick snapshot of our Chamber of Commerce. Claudia, give us the give us your elevator speech. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, so the mission of the Amherst Area Chamber is to really create, maintain, promote a vital and thriving business climate um, throughout the Amherst area. And the Amherst area includes Amherst, Hadley, Belchertown, um, Pelham, Leverett, Shinsbury, Sunderland. And so um, we're here to initiate support all the civic, educational, recreational, economic well-being um, of the Amherst area. So, uh, but as Gabrielle said, uh, you know, we are here to represent our membership in that area, but we're also here in, in unity. <laughs> so in unity with this entire team. I'm getting some back, some feedback. Are you hearing feedback? I'm hearing a little feedback too, and perhaps the technical people are in the background there working to make sure that our listeners don't hear the feedback. Well, let's hope that's the case, because if there's a problem, I assume they'll interrupt us so we can uh, try to fix the problem before we continue. Okay. So um, let's, uh, let's uh, refocus now on the question of, of what you're hearing from the business community. And I know that 
Uh, there's a lot of interaction, I'm sure, people calling your offices, both the bid and the chamber. But uh, it's my understanding uh, that the bid actually went out and did some survey work. Uh, and that survey work might actually have been done before the coronavirus problems uh, hit us. But so, um, Gabrielle, why don't you tell us about the surveys that you were engaged in uh, prior to connecting up with the chamber on the um, coronavirus work you're doing. Absolutely, Stan. So we ran a survey right when um, Amherst College and UMass decided to close their doors um, with our local just downtown businesses. The chamber ran a survey about three weeks ago to the greater Amherst area, and both of them have been invaluable to moving forward with um, state legislation, working with the town, and even federal le legisla legislation. We've been able to send a lot of information along to uh, Secretary Kenney Neely, uh, Baker, um, our senators, it's, and, and Rep. Mindy Dom has been wonderful with us. Um, I will say that our very first survey came back with some incredibly dire numbers. This was before there seemed to be any relief or resiliency coming, um, before the PPP, before the IDLE, before our foundation, which we're going to get to with you. Um, and we had some staggering numbers of businesses saying that without relief and without help, 70% did not think that they could make it through May. We are at the beginning of May. Um, a lot has changed since then. Uh, Claudia and I love to use the word pivot. Um, we feel like that is all we are doing and our businesses are doing it as well. Those who can come back online have done this. The Chambers um, uh, survey came back with not great numbers, but not as dire as the PPP loans and the idle loans came through, but we're still looking at record numbers of layoffs, especially in the service and the retail industry. Um, there are businesses that have been able to come back at some capacity. Uh, to be clear, it is not nearly the capacity that they need to to survive, but at least they're they're here. But we have a lot of businesses who cannot come back based on the restrictions that are being um, passed down rightfully by Governor Baker. Um, Claudia, I'll let you talk a little bit about the survey that was second to ours. Sure, I think we realized that relief was coming in, you know, and as that we saw things turn a little bit. Um, I should say though, stepping back a little, we really, for people that don't know us, um, and know the bid in the chamber, we share an office. So the day we closed our, our doors, our physical doors, um, we have been connected at the hip and have really um, supported one another in our efforts and also uh, really unified in, in putting out efforts to support our businesses. There ha all our lines have sort of been blurred and, and we've just really tried to do what's best for our business owners, period. Um, not just for our, our, our members, but for everyone that we can possibly support at this point. There is no one immune. Um, so the, her, her, the first numbers were really telling just to give us an inkling of, you know, where um, the trauma was setting in. Uh, but then we felt like we needed a second pulse because we did hear about more and more of our, you know, we've worked through them with them going through the PPP process. Uh, and the state has been incredibly supportive because we had a bunch of folks who were stuck in that process and they needed help. Um, so we've been able to support them. Um, you know, we basically have a steady stream of businesses contacting us daily. A lot of gig economy workers who are looking for that PUA support. Um, so we felt that second survey was important. And that second survey really, um, unfortunately, gave us a really, really big numbers. You know, $55,000 of um, lost revenue per business on average. So uh, for our small businesses, so that's a big chunk um, on a, for a monthly um, range, and 50% of them reported that they laid off one or more persons. Uh, you know, so those all of a sudden, and then we also were looking at pre-COVID, you know, 3% unemployment, and it, you know, so now we're looking at nearly 20%. So all of a sudden, those numbers are really dire. Um, however, I thought what was really interesting, uh, we felt like. A lot of the comments when we asked what you would add to it was that they said, do the things that are safest, do what's right, um, keep our employees, our employers, and most importantly, you know, and our clients safe. So they weren't, um, I mean, everyone wants to reopen, everyone, but they're, they're, they, I didn't hear that impatience quite yet. So I think they're really wanting to do the right thing. So that was really inspiring. So you were really able to gather quite a bit of information 
uh, from people as in real time as they are experiencing this. And uh, this is causing quite a bit of economic dislocation uh, among these businesses and for our community. And uh, of course, with the closing of the university and the colleges, uh, our, our major industry of higher education meant that their clients were leaving town. Of course, there are, what, 18, 19,000 of us who live in town, who, we're their customers as well. <laughs> that said, right. a lot of people who left the town who um, basically there and left with their business and they're all sequestered in their homes all over the state, the country, the world. Mm -hmm. So, um, so what are we doing about this is I guess the, the next part of the conversation and um, Gabrielle, when you were on the show, Oh, I don't know, four or five, six months ago, we talked about your vision for, creating a foundation for the community that you were going to raise some money and that money was going to be invested in things for the community that would help spur and prop up and expand our local economy it wasn't directly money for the businesses, but it was money for the community. And you got your 501c3 and then what happened? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the Downtown Amherst Foundation was originally created to be an arts and culture driver for our downtown area, and that was our intention. We were going to raise quite a bit of money to build and create arts and culture as a uh, destination leader for our downtown. Um, and literally, as Claudia said, the day that the Amherst Chamber and the bid closed our doors to the public, um, our, our physical doors in town, uh, our IRS letter came giving us our our full um, 501c3 uh, status, which was bittersweet. It uh, did not take long before Claudia and I started again talking just on that daily basis. I'm hearing this from this business, we're hearing, um, and kind of also needing that emotional support of sharing the stories back and forth and not just having the burden of that be on either one of our shoulders. Um, and we started saying, okay, we've got to do something. We started weekly meetings with the town. What is the town government going to be able to do? Um, we're both talking a lot outside of our area. I, I'm on the phone on a daily basis with Boston, New York, the Cape, the islands, you know, what are all these other communities doing? Um, this isn't like a great fire that rips through a town and we can all sort of rally behind and build it back up. This is a global um, economic you know, issue. So one night we were talking, I think it was a Friday less than three weeks ago, and we said, what if we took the foundation, which is a 501c3, and pivoted it, shifted the miss mission slightly to become a resiliency grant maker. Um, within, I think, 48 hours, we designed a website, we opened a bank account, we got a, a patronicity sort of quote unquote, GoFundMe site live. Um, we reached out to five remarkable Amherst residents um, who have no stake in whether or not this goes well. Um, they're not landlords, they're not business people who you know will thrive or, or not thrive based on any other business in town doing well. And they jumped on immediately and said, yes, we will be the committee that will review these grants. And um, we went live two weeks ago. Within two weeks, we raised over $170,000 in funds. And we opened our grant application on May 1st for our first round of small business micro grants. And these grants will be up to $15,000. We have a really um, wonderful application that is on our website. Um, it's simple. It is kind. It's not some, you know, unbelievable, you know, Kresge grant or, or bank loan application that is daunting. And um, we're really looking forward to handing these to our committee and to letting them go through them. They have a rubric. This is going to be done very fairly. And our first grant application process, we are looking at as a resiliency grant and a sustainability grant and we are hoping to do a second round of grants that are going to be a reopening grant. Great and so um, who's been contributing to this fund? $170,000 raised that quickly. Mm -hmm. What was what's the average grant? Uh, I'm sorry the contributions. What's the average contribution size? How many people have contributed to this fund already? I'm gonna let Claudia take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to do the quick math here on the on the average size, but you're talking. We're actually almost up to 175,000, and uh, I think it's 177 donors. 
So you're, you're looking at an average that, that there was one or lot, two large gifts, very large, generous okay. gifts. Yeah. But, um, you know, we're seeing checks of 500, 2,500, 100, 25. Uh, online and checks, we're getting both, uh, you know, people have really committed to this in a unique uh, and responded to this. But I think we both had a pulse of the, the general sense of support local has really um, surfaced, right? A and in real time right now. And so I feel like we also hit upon a, a need that people have just been wanting to do so much more. We, we did create some other initiatives together. Um, you know, we have an open for business um, listing that we share all the open businesses so that folks can, um, you know, people know who's open for business, how they can help them because the help is out there. People really want to support our community. So I think that has been always driving us. We started a tip jar so we can help our gig economy workers, pay our hairdressers, pay the folks who can't work at all right now. Um, and our bartenders, our favorite folks, our favorite servers, right, at our local spots. And we all have them. And uh, so, you know, these are just, this is among the efforts that we've done together. And we currently have an open list of all who's open for business. And I think the nice thing is we're seeing more businesses start to reopen um, and also pivot, <laughs> um, innovate, and create some new ways of doing business. No. A lot of creativity going on here. A lot, a lot of people coming, stepping up to the plate as they say, no, no contribution too big or too small. Every little bit is going to help. Every bit helps. And this really is a demonstration of community and community spirit because mm -hmm. these are people, local people, supporting local businesses, not in exchange for goods and services, but because they want to keep this economy going and get these businesses reopened and people reemployed. So that's really <laughs> terrific. So what's coming next? So we have a deadline coming up uh, for the first round of grants. When those grants go out, it'll be how long about a week or 10 days or two weeks after the deadline? We would like to see our grants go out uh, mid-May. Um, so it's going to be okay. a pretty fast turnaround. Um, we feel like they need relief now. Um, one of the things that we heard from many businesses leading up to our decision to do this micro grant problem, uh, program is um, they could not take on more debt. Um, it was just something, especially with the uncertainty. I think if there was an absolute, we know how long this is going to last, or there, there's, a, there's a date, I think that would help your ability to say, okay, I could borrow some money right now, but we don't know what that date is. And, um, you know, it has been, you know, it was May 4th at one point, that was yesterday. We're looking at May 18th. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are saying Massachusetts probably mid to late June. So those numbers really, um, those dates affect someone's ability um, to, to have hope. So we'd like to get these this first round out as soon as possible, so mid-May, and give them that hope to know that they will be um, ready to come back online when the time comes. Fantastic. And the second round applications will begin to be collected when? We have some work to do. We've got some fundraising to do. So Claudia and I are going to get out there and um, pound the digital pavement. Um, Claudia and I have both worked on fundraising our whole lives and I have never in my life asked for a major donation via, hi, we've never met and here's an email. Um, <laughs> so these are like very wild times for us. Um, right. But we have some Even fundraising the committee, to do. right? Even getting our committee together. We've never, half of them we've never met, all cold calling. <laughs> the most fantastic committed committee possible yeah everything's been done very differently <laughs> so yes. step one is we got to raise the money step raise two money. is we're going to have another round right. and the second round will still be focused on sustainability or will it start to edge into plans for reopening and re-engaging is yeah, that the way you're thinking of it Stan, we hope so. We really hope that the second round is a reopening. And if we can do a third round, we're hoping that it is um, an invigoration round. So we, we get some people sustained, 
we get them reopen and then maybe they can come and say, I've got this fantastic idea and we can help support that. Again, we want to return Amherst to stability um, for our businesses and our community and our nonprofits because our nonprofits rely heavily on the businesses for support. Um, and then we want to go back to our original plan that Claudia and I were working so much on of Destination Amherst and create a year round vibrant community that Amherst is its own thing that is complemented by the university and the college, but is quite a remarkable town all on its own. <laughs> Terrific. And uh, so Claudia, what else is coming after uh, we're working on the second and maybe third round of grants? What other longer term plans are you looking at? Or is it just really too difficult right now because everything has to be focused on the survival of our, lo our local businesses? Yeah, I think we're really still working on recovery planning right now. That's the most important piece that I feel like that's as far out as we have gone. And you just okay. caught us on the heels of presenting to town council last night. Um, we have been, as, as Gabrielle said, we're on the calls with, I'm on the calls with other chambers. She's on the other calls with the bids. Um, we're looking at other town reopening plans and strategies and um, also working with Mindy to report to our recovery committee that will go to and report to Governor Baker. So we will have a meeting as well to share our feedback and what those needs will be. Um, and so we've already begun to do some of that sharing so we can get this, as much state support. The town is going to be really struggling, right? Um, there's going to be yeah. a lot of loss to the town budget. Um, but at the same time, you know, we want to get back to that destination Amherst. So how do we climb mm -hmm. our way out of this and get a recovery plan in place that's going to capture um, the spirit of our community and our town um, but also be proactive enough so that we're ready. So when he says, you know, whatever, whatever those, however that comes in phases, you know, obviously we want it to be the most safe, but um, we really want to be ready. The shovel ready is sort of the, the new term, right? Um, and the buzzword, but I think we, we talked a lot about, can we look at our licensing and permitting and fast tracking things so that uh, we can do outdoor dining and um, alcohol use maybe in gen more general areas so that you know more restaurants can participate. We've seen a lot of plans coming out that include outdoor dining only, for example, in the first rollout to keep people safe. So that's gonna be all new for us. A lot of folks don't have that opportunity or option. So both public ways and private um, you know, property owners, if they work with their um, tenants to really make that possible, um, you know, and that's just one facet of what we've talked to the town about to try to think about, you know, what, what PPP needs do they have? Um, what do they need tables and chairs? You know, they are gonna need a lot. And basically mm -hmm. the survey really revealed that they're gonna have a hard enough time meeting just the basic payroll utilities, right? And their rents. Um, so anything we can do to diffuse some of those costs for them and any barrier to, you know, building some revenue for them and getting them back on their feet. Like Gabrielle said, they've been pivoting. They've been doing an amazing amount of work but it's not nearly the levels that they were at. So, you know, we're really hoping to work with the plan and also that it's a unified message that um, we're so grateful the town has been really to, uh, willing to listen to the data that we've collected. Um, and we brought it to the town council in the hopes that um, not only is licensing, but also other zoning laws, because that's gonna feed into the shorter long-term, you know, the uh, short long-term of this, because can we do some easy, um, some zoning changes that will make it at least a little easier to do business in Amherst. Um, so it sounds like we're trying to take advantage of this yes. situation <laughs> to basically say it's not going to be business as usual. We have to think in different ways because mm -hmm. even when we are allowed to go out of our homes and begin to shop and begin mm -hmm. to be more engaged in the community, it's not going to be business as usual, at least for the foreseeable future. So we have to think differently, which means the government has to think differently and act differently. And we're going to have to let go of some of the things mm -hmm. that may have been seen or believed to be necessary, which when you look at those things in the environment we're in now, you realize, well, they're not that important when you compare those things to these other things because we're going to have to change here in order to have a vibrant economy and to restore our community life. 
And that's basically sounds to me like the message you were delivering is it can't be business as usual. It, we cannot go back to all the usual processes and procedures that slow things down and, and make you do the same thing you've always done. You got to think differently. Bingo. <laughs> Sounds like okay. I was paid to say that, but I wasn't. <laughs> thank you for the PSA. <laughs> hey, listen, we'll use that. <laughs> I, I, re I really want to thank both of you for the work that you're doing to help our local businesses and help our people get back to work. And um, I hope lots of people who are listening will decide to contribute to the fund that you guys are working on so that we can have the second and third round of grants. It's a way of showing your support for the community, for your neighbors, for the businesses in town who are your neighbors and uh, ch fellow churchgoers and, and whatever. So uh, we really all have to do our part here. And I just wanna thank both of you for the energy you're bringing. It's so obvious in today's show, just how much energy and passion you have. And I wanna to say to all of the listeners, so, you know, stay safe. You got a distance, you gotta wear those masks. Mm -hmm. it's so social isolation is not easy. So spend some time every day thinking about people you haven't talked to in a while and mm -hmm. give them a call because many of them are alone. Well, Claudia and I like to say, please check on your extrovert friends. We're not okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we want everybody to be connecting in whatever way they can at a safe distance. Absolutely. And with that, so with sweet, that, yes. I think I'm going to thank you both and thank the listeners for joining us. I don't know when we'll be back on again, but we will be back on again at some point with more regular shows. But we thought this was really important to... Uh, uh, make a show around this. We were planning to have you on, Claudia, anyway, uh, before we had to suspend, but here we are. And, and so thank you all very much for watching and we'll look forward to uh, reconnecting with you all, both on the air and in the community. Thank you, Stan. Stay safe. You're welcome. Thank you, looking forward to it. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. Stay well. And you.